of good afternoon and of course um of course um it's time for my a league and newcastle district cricket tips which of course start this week and of course uh the jets had a had a memorable win over the central coast mariners last night up in gosford which is just absolutely brilliant and of course it was up in the men's competition but Things did not go well for the Jets women's side after they were after they were hammered by Melbourne City 5-1. And of course, um, and of course there was uh, uh, there's been a few wins right up in the uh, into yeah, and of course good news right up into uh, uh, right up in Newcastle. Um, uh, they were crowned um, champions after beating the Central Coast right up into the regional um, Big Bash Grand Final, which is just absolutely amazing. Now, on to my tips. Uh, to round eight of the of the A League of the A League men's competition, I've gone for the Jets to beat the Roar, um, and of course uh, Newcastle plays at McDonald Jones Stadium this weekend. And of course, I've gone for Wellington to beat um, Adelaide United. And of course, the Phoenix play back in New Zealand. And also, um, I've chosen the Mariners to defeat um, Sydney FC on the Central Coast. And also, it's a battle of the Melburnians, um, which is another F3 derby with the city, for which I've chosen to beat um, the ones who who I'm hoping will not win this one, the victory. And of course, I've chosen Western United to beat the Western Sydney Wanderers. Now, let's go to the women's side, and it's round five. And of course, um, I've chosen the Phoenix to defeat Adelaide. Also, I've chosen the Brisbane Roar to upset the Western Sydney Wanderers. I've chosen Melbourne City to beat um, the Western Sydney Wanderers. I've chosen... Um, I've chosen Melbourne. I've chosen Melbourne City to beat um, Western United. Also, I've chosen the Newcastle Jets to beat Melbourne Victory, and also I've chosen Canberra United to beat Perth Glory. And finally, the last one, the uh, round nine of the Newcastle District Cricket, which kicks off in January 2023, which is good. And of course, I've gone for Belmont. To beat Charlestown, Merriweather to smash Wars End, and of course Newcastle City to defeat um, Stockton and Northern Districts. Also, Wildtown Mayfield to defeat West, Cardiff Bulleroo to annihilate Hamwicks, and Toronto to defeat the University of Newcastle. Uh, well, that's about it for me. Well, that's about it for me. I'll see you next week. Uh, let's go back to um, uh, the best local sporting memories and the best local news from August 2000. And of course, it's where um, the Olympic torch arrived in Newcastle, Lake Macquarie and the Hunter. And also, St. Francis uh, um, Xavier became the first Newcastle school to go through to the Nature Grain Cup Grand Final. And of course, um, the Newcastle Knights managed to um, defeat the Melbourne Storm in a um, in a home qualifying elimination final. Brett Cowburn is a familiar face in Novocastrian soccer circles, albeit an older one. 21 years ago, he played his first season with the then national team KB United. Since then, he's focused on youth development, coaching the Breakers junior sides. This season, he's stepping up as Breakers youth coach. I think it's going to be a very good squad. Um, ultimately, our goal is to pass players on to Lee in the first team squad. Um, so primarily, our aim isn't to win competitions. But uh, obviously, if we've got good enough players, that's what we'll do. He'll be helped by assistant coach Alex Tagarelius. I've worked with Brett Cowburn with the Super Youth League teams over the last couple of seasons. Um, so I'm looking forward to a really good time. Meanwhile, the Breakers have snared the signatures of Sydney Olympics Peter Sakinas and Wollongong's Anthony Surgeon. Both will bolster the midfield. They're both great characters for our club. Um, they'll certainly help with the, the Catlins and the Harbours with the leadership stakes. 
Veteran striker Andy Harper still hasn't decided if he'll stay in Newcastle this season. Lee Steary, though, is confident he'll return. Missing the two penalties towards the end of last year and us not getting in the six, I think, you know, he, he knows we've got some unfinished business. The main changes are that the new development control plan will measure heights from ground level, including roof plant structures such as air conditioning units, and will incorporate view corridors into the established height limits. In some instances, the actual height profile has been lowered. In other instances, it's been allowed to increase slightly. The aim of the DCP 57 is to protect the heritage value of the East End without stifling investment and development. Concerns over car parking were not included in the new plan and those considerations will be deferred until the council's study on that issue is completed. While the plan has been adopted by council, it will be reviewed in 12 months. Though there is likely to be some fine tuning then, interested parties will be able to turn to the new plan with confidence. If a developer comes up to the counter today and asks about the, uh, their proposal or if residents want to know what the guidelines are, that's the document. A large proportion of Australia's new military hardware is now constructed in the Hunter, from British Aerospace's new Hawk fighter trainers to ADI's fleet of mine hunters and repairs on the Navy's fastest supercat. Today, Department of Defence heavyweights called local industry bosses together to update them on how best to apply for a slice of the $5 billion spent annually. We're telling them how we're going about some of our new organisations and processes to make it easier to do business with us, uh, what the particular opportunities are in various areas of defence, and also what our prime contractors have available in the local area. Well, it's increasing and, and it has the potential to increase even more, but it's up to us in the, in the Hunter to, to get involved. A general review of Australia's armed forces is also underway and people have the chance to comment next Thursday night at the Radisson Hotel in Newcastle at 6 o'clock. Going round Australia to seek everybody's views on what our Defence Force will look like in future, what tasks it will be able to perform, what capabilities it will need to perform them. Paul Lobb, NBN News. In sight of reaching the ultimate prize, Newcastle isn't letting any chance slip by. But the Knights refused to even entertain thoughts of a grand final berth. No, because I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> we have a game to play. That's what's important. Buoyed by a great weekend that started with a win against Melbourne, including no major injury worries, and finished with the Knights earning this weekend off, even the players know there's still plenty to be done. Why well, should you get carried away? We're, we're a long way from, from achieving what we're after. Solving a few defensive problems was one goal at the weekend and there were few leaks against the Storm. The Knights will play the winner of the Roosters Raiders match in two weeks under lights in Sydney. I've no preference mate, I'd, I'd, I'm happy to play either side and beat either side. The Melbourne match also closed the playing chapter in the career of both Bats and Matthew Johns at home. They left Marathon Stadium for the last time as winners. All that's left is to finish the season as premiers. As for the future playing days of the unsigned Paul Rahihi and Lenny Beckett, it's believed the Knights may soon withdraw an offer to Beckett if he doesn't make a decision soon. And the club is searching to find the Kiwi forward work to ensure he can stay with the club for next season. Jim Callanan, NBN News. Dramatic is the best way to describe the way St Francis Xavier reached the final of the prestigious schoolboy competition. Up 24-6 against Dixon College, the Canberra School ran in three converted tries in ten minutes to level. After a nail-biting few minutes, the Newcastle-based high school held on, 24 all, and advanced to the final after scoring more tries in the match. They'll play either St Gregory's Campbelltown or Palm Beach Corumbin in the decider in two weeks. Meanwhile, in Newcastle Rugby League, Gavin Cook has had his judiciary hearing postponed until Thursday night after he was sent off yesterday for this tackle against Waratah. It's the second time the West Centre has been ordered from the field this season, but was only one of a number of controversial decisions in the drawn game. 
Lake Macquarie sailors Chris Nicholson and Daniel Phillips have won the European 49er Grand Prix Series despite finishing eighth overall in the final regatta in Finland. The pair will represent Australia at the Olympics. And Hamilton have to beat Cessnock in the preliminary final for the chance to defend its NBN Soccer League title. Edgeworth has already won through to the grand final after beating the Hornets in yesterday's major semi-final. Uh, with Newcastle um, on the edge of um, now, without a soccer club, uh, there could be um, there could be a brand new team for Newcastle underway called Newcastle United. Uh, Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Three out of four was the verdict for the Canberra Raiders. The two heavy tackles coming under scrutiny all week. If you look at the number of near misses in that game and the amount of players involved in reports, it adds to testimony that my thoughts of the club culture of Canberra and other clubs can lead you into some trouble. There is an intensely practiced technique where there's two men in a tackle, one defender tries to lift the attacking player's leg in the air, which enables both defenders to get him on the ground and slows the motion of the player the ball down. But if the two tackles assume the leg lifting role unknowingly at the same time in the heat of the game, it's very easy to go across the line of horizontal, where all intentions of a clean tackle can go wrong. In that same game, Laurie Daly gets my hit of the week in contrast. On to this weekend's semis, the Eels v Penrith, tomorrow night at the Sydney Football Stadium. The Penrith are without Pulatua, Mark Guy, and Matt Adamson, who's been struggling with a calf injury all week, is still expected to play. They hit a young, aggressive side from Parramatta, led by Jimmy Dimmick, who's taken up the senior role since Jason Smith's suspension. Rod Will, Gower and Gurla are in great form for the Panthers. It's hard to split these two teams, but I am going to Penrith. Now to Sunday's clash and the meeting between the two greats of the modern game, Fiddler and Daly. Canberra's three suspended players combined with the Roosters' record 10 out of 11 games on their home turf, which some experts say is an unfair advantage in the semi-finals. After the Roosters' soul-searching this week, I'm tipping them to win and play Newcastle next week. Well, it's all starting to heat up. I'll see you next week. Feeling the nerves that come with any grand final match, Terrigal Avoca players have tried to stay focused during their final training session this week. With three new forwards, the team has plenty of new combinations to work on, but they'll be sticking to basics come tomorrow's grand final. I just follow on from our tactics that we've shown throughout the year, just to be hard at the ball and to stick to our team plan and not expect to do anything different just because it's grand final day, just to stick to what we're doing. As minor premiers, Terrigal Avoca is favourite for the Clash and have had the wood on their rivals Cardiff in their last two outings, including the major semi final just two weeks ago. But the Panthers know anything can happen on grand final day. They're a very good side and they've got a history of being a very um, competitive side and they've put in some good performances this year. Undoubtedly, it's going to be a very close contest and the old cliche it's be the best team that plays on the day or win the game. While Cardiff may lack experience, its strong marking forwards more than make up for it. But they have one Panther in their sights, Maury Gulagong. He's such a strong man. Um, and we've got a few tricks, obviously, for him. So if we can keep him under about five, we're, we're in with a real show. But the Coast has cleared its trophy cabinet, hoping to add the oldest sporting trophy in Australia, the Black Diamond Cup, to the collection. Well, I believe it's the oldest sporting trophy in Australia, so it's, it's pretty special in that respect, and uh, we're certainly looking forward to bringing it back to the Central Coast. Sorry, it's a bit all over the <coughs> Boxing remains the, remains the only sport never to be played in the Olympics. And of course, that's what one Newcastle boxer has to do. And of course, is to take on his rival this weekend. And of course, it comes at the Newcastle Entertainment Centre this Saturday. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Andrew Johns has won it all in rugby league last night, adding to his trophy cabinet. The only trouble, Johns is running out of room. You, you must have a, a very full 
trophy cabinet by now. Uh, they're actually in my underpants drawer, so they're pretty safe there. No, I'll go near them. <laughs> Meanwhile, concerns over brother Matthew's right thigh in the lead-up to Saturday's semi against the Storm have eased. The 5'8", now close to peak fitness. Yesterday I was still sort of running only at lucky to be half speed, but today I'm getting close to stride down 100%, so I won't have any problems whatsoever. Making his return to the top grade at the right end of the season is Darren Albert, at the expense of the informed Lenny Beckett. The speedster has only played a handful of first grade games this year, but is confident the injury woes are behind him. Once again, fans have snapped up tickets for the marathon clash. 10,000 sold today, another 8,000 remaining. Blake Doyle, NBN News. After nine seasons with one of Australia's most dominant sides in Sydney Olympic, Peter Sakenis comes to Newcastle with a healthy CV. The 27-year-old has captained his old club and was part of Australia's Olympic campaign in Barcelona. Describing himself as a creative midfielder, Sakenis likes nothing more than to control the play. A big draw card for him, the possibility of playing with Andy Harper and John Bonavoglia. Andy Harper is certainly one player that I'd like to have in front of me and obviously you mentioned Johnny who's undoubtedly one of the, the, the quicker and, and more skillful strikers in the league so you know as a midfielder you uh, you know you need players like in front of you it makes you look good and makes you know helps the team do well. Sakenis is also joined in the midfield by former Wollongong player Anthony Surgeon. In limbo after the Wolves NSL final victory, Surgeon is happy to head north. Definitely, yeah, looking to just miss out on the six last year and they're, they're a young side so um, hopefully they'll get hungrier and uh, we'll cement a spot in the six this season, yeah. Surgeon and Sakenis have ten weeks to meld with the side before the NSL season kicks off on October 13. Blake Doyle, NBN News. Round two, the Knights thrash Melbourne at Marathon Stadium. Round 13, the Storm crushes Newcastle at Olympic Park. This Saturday, the NRL finals will prove decisive in more ways than one. Ben Kennedy just one night out to settle the score. I guess it's uh, one all. you know, we gave them a bit of a touch-up and they gave us a bit of a touch-up, so it's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, you know, obviously we've got the, the home crowd and the home ground, so, uh, you know, we're looking for a big one. The big forward has taken things easier training this week under the watchful eye of his son Bryce and looks certain to play despite that ankle injury. Meanwhile, retiring skipper Tony Butterfield has taken time to meet the club's youngest member, four-week-old Samuel Lethbridge. And perhaps the Knights should keep an eye on their fledgling fan, born just over four and a half kilos or ten pounds six on the old scale, Samuel's sure to be future front row material. But it's the Knights' current players who concern Chris Anderson. And even though the Knights haven't won a finals match since 1997, the outspoken coach isn't about to label them chokers. Uh, ask me after Saturday. <laughs> the storm flew into Sydney Airport before boarding a bus for Newcastle. Players shown every sign they're entering enemy territory. Colin Baldwin, NBN News. Neither team had reached this far in the competition and for Dixon College it couldn't have started worse. A mistake in goal saw Francis Xavier on the attack and a blindside raid wasn't read by Dixon College defence and Ryan O'Connor was over. Another mistake, another try. Centre Joel Rawlings continuing his try feast in the statewide competition. Trying to turn things around, Dixon College got it all wrong. Two on report for this tackle on Michael Small. No problems for winger Ryan Turton. He crossed untouched. Again in the left corner, and Xavier's was up 14-0. A run of penalties helped spark a home side revival and Dixon College got back within reach after Wayne Robinson landed there first. The second half started like the first, with prop Ryan O'Connor scoring. And when Hugh Ryan raced over just minutes later, Xavier looked to have a final spot sewn up at 24-6. But an incredible comeback saw the Canberra-based college rack up three converted tries in less than 10 minutes. When fullback Warren Colson crossed and then converted, it was 24-all. But with Francis Xavier scoring one more try, it advanced to the final for the very first time.
Wet weather football, always cold but rarely pretty, and today was no different in the first half. Hamilton showed few effects after backing up from an extra time effort last weekend. Corey Flipsovic coming close on two occasions, just desperate defence keeping him out. Maitland's frustrations were obvious. But both sides went to the break scoreless. After half-time, the weather cleared, but Filipsevic broke the scoring drought, making it look easy from a set piece. Maitland's best chance of the match actually led to their downfall. Olympic catching them on the break with Filipsevic finding open spaces and another goal for a 2-0 lead. In the middle of everything, he then laid one on for Trent Austin, who struck home Olympic's third. His celebration almost as good as the finish. Fine football on the pitch, ugly scenes off them as officials heated up on a cold afternoon. But Filipsevic had the last say in a match he dominated, catching and delivering a cross straight into the net for his third. Hamilton 4-1 winners. St. Francis Xavier College were uh, uh, wafted to Sydney to quickly go through to their first ever grand the final. The team's been great um, and the skill level's very good too. And when you're playing 25 minute halves, you can't afford to make too many errors. They scored plenty of tries right up in the first elimination semi final. Because of that, they'll take on St. Gregory's in the two. Because of that, they'll take on. Um, St. Gregory's in the Neutral Grain Cup Grand Final. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. You couldn't get a more contrasting build-up to a semi-final. The home side, Newcastle, went behind locked doors midweek. But after blowing in last night, the storm showed they had nothing to hide today. We tried to learn from our experiences last year that we don't tighten up too much. I mean, we, we need to relax and enjoy it and, and stay focused, but make sure that we're ready to play football on the day. In fact, with several former Newcastle faces in the side, they can't wait to get out on the paddock again tomorrow. It's a highlight of the year, especially this time of year if you're playing in the semis. Boys, I hope it's going to be a, a nice big crowd here, you know, 25 plus, I hope, and I hope they're all their heads off at us, yeah. For Brett Kamali, he's back to his former home ground as the game's best number seven and with the Blues and Kangaroo halfback jobs. But tomorrow's game is being billed as the unofficial test of the best against Andrew Johns. I suppose the only way to decide is on the paddock, you know. Obviously, it's been good to get named there the other day, but uh, I suppose tomorrow, tomorrow's the, uh, probably the last time we'll play each other this year and you know, there's a lot at stake at the end of the year and, and like you said, maybe the best halfback will be decided tomorrow. But for a player who was once Johns' understudy at Newcastle, playing well in his old hometown means that little bit more. I can sort of prove a few points. You know, if I come here and play well, then you know, I might probably earn a little bit more respect up here. As Kangaroos coach, Chris Anderson says the World Cup halfback job won't be decided on one game, but he's still looking forward to the clash nonetheless. It's just going to be a pleasure to watch them both play, isn't it? You know, they're both tremendous footballers. Late today, there were still around 4,000 general admission tickets left with the game on NBN tomorrow afternoon from 4 o'clock. Jim Callanan, NBN News. 16-year-old Travis Lynch is just one of many hoping for an overnight change in the swell at Merriweather Beach. He'll be competing in the two-day Merriweather Teams Challenge, the second largest event of its kind in Australia and a springboard for up-and-coming grommets. I have been in the past, so we've actually developed the strength of Australian surfing and we're hoping to um, recreate that and, and put Australia back up there on a world stage in a greater place. This year's event will see the likes of Matt Hoy, Simon Law, Nathan Webster and Damien Hardman. I've always admired Damien surfing and while I was a lot younger I still really looked up to guys like him and also Matt Hoy who's surfing for us and Simon Law and people like that so it would be a really good chance to surf with those guys. Ten eight-man teams, including Catherine Hill Bay, Avoca, Ballina and Merriweather, will fight it out for a $4,000 prize kitty. 
Meanwhile, it's the end of the line for either Hamilton or Maitland tomorrow in NBN Soccer League's minor semi-final with the loser eliminated. The winner of Sunday's game will advance straight to the grand final. In round 17, Newcastle Rugby League action, there are two games tomorrow, while on Sunday the West Waratah clash and the Lake Cessnock games are the pick. And in Newcastle Rugby Union, the battle for third and fourth spot continues tomorrow between the Waratahs and Hamilton. Eastern Districts, Uni and Nelson Bay are all at home. Both West and Waratah Mayfield have a huge history of becoming rivals in the Newcastle Rugby League. But however, Waratah Mayfield secured a victory. Waratah Mayfield, of course, um, uh, uh, will now face Curry Curry. Wildtar Mayfield will now face Nelson Bay in Wildtar Mayfield will now face their rivals next weekend. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Body and mind have been the focus for the Knights today. Two training sessions taking care of the former, a bonding session tonight looking after the latter. While it will be an informal gathering, experienced campaigners like the Johns brothers, Tony Butterfield and Billy Peden are expected to come to the fore as the players discuss their hopes and dreams at the culmination of a tough season. We've had uh, something like 27 games you know, straight, so to have that week off is, is just a good little sort of downtime for us. And yeah, as I said, we can get away and, and set a few goals and, and sort of look to the rest of the series. Meanwhile, Adam McDougal was ill and didn't train this morning, and Andrew Johns was resting up. The club, though, saying there's no injury concerns for the semis. And a brief but welcome break for some young patients at Newcastle's John Hunter Hospital today, with a performance by champion buskers, Split Sound. Ben Mingay and Paul Corber won the night's inaugural busking competition, which raised $1,700 for the hospital's oncology unit. Injured fullback Robbie O'Davis handed over the welcome funds. Newcastle Lord Mayor John Tate has assembled a group of nine people whose task it is to find the best transport system for Newcastle. The committee is made up of a number of people who I uh, believe are at arm's length from any form of government. Among those taking part, Samaritan's boss Seth Shevels, business leader Ian Pedersen, rail expert Milton Morris, retiring Trades Hall secretary Peter Barrick and Hunter Health boss Catherine McGrath. Members of the group and councillors will travel to Melbourne tomorrow to investigate the use of trams. I understand they have trams running on a rail corridor and uh, we want to see how that operates, how the trams get on and off the, the tram line onto the train line and how that all works. Meantime, recognition in the inner city today for a group of volunteers with the night care program. Church volunteers are providing sausage sandwiches and hot drinks to people in the inner city every Saturday night. It's a project praised by police. It sort of takes the anger and aggression out of uh, the, of the people that are uh, in the vicinity and acts as a calming influence over everyone. Paul Lobb, NBN News. The combined competition's first grand final saw a Central Coast side take on a Newcastle team and it was the visitors who had a great start to the decider, Dave Jackman kicking the first. Dean Wall grabbed a loose clearance and Terry Lavoca had a second goal in quick time. Brendan Bailey's effort summed up Cardiff's opening quarter, hitting the post. No such luck for Southam, who kicked home another. And while it didn't look pretty, Tom Viviano got the home side's first major. After a slow start to the game, Terrigal Avoca's Mori Goolagong got on the score sheet in trademark fashion. That seemed to spring the full forward to life. He booted home another major in good time, and Terrigal Avoca enjoyed a healthy lead. In fact, by quarter time, they were up by 39 points. Cardiff rallied, but couldn't get back within reach of the Panthers. Terrigal of Ogre, eventual winners, 17-16-118 to 10-18-78, with Dave Hamilton voted best on ground.
There was one good thing up at the right in Newcastle Rugby Union, and of course, um, and of course, Eastern Districts had a player sent off due to injury. Meanwhile, the Wanderers scored a try. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. On the 27th of this month, all eyes will be focused on Newcastle as the Olympic torch is run through the city's streets. And rehearsals for the celebrations which will accompany the torch are in full swing in Newcastle. We've got pathways to work with, we've got slopes to work with, we've got four stages to work with and we've got the water so we need to coordinate all those things. The celebrations will start in the early evening with the cauldron being lit at 7pm. A highlight will be 16 international choirs and 22 local choirs which will combine at the Foreshore Amphitheatre, making the celebrations some of the biggest Newcastle has seen. Meanwhile, some primary school students are also getting ready, warming up to give their own message to the Tongan Olympic team. The group of 30 students from St Columban's Primary School in Mayfield will travel to the Olympic Village to welcome the athletes on the 12th of September. Adam Harper, NBN News. Curry came out firing at Maitland Sports Ground, Danny Lenane posting the first try, the Northern Blues failing to defuse a bomb and giving Leo Dinover the second. Both sides then swapped tries before the Blues rallied, Mixie Louie charged over, while a lucky bounce to Wayne Clifford gave Northern an 18-16 half-time lead. The start of the second was all Bulldogs. Lenane first sending Todd Osland on his way before scoring two tries of his own and giving Curry a seemingly unbeatable 30-18 advantage. The Blues, though, only saw red. Clayton Witten first blasting through, then Mixie Louie made a further mockery of Curry's defence. At 30-all, Mark Jones nailed what many thought was the match winner. But then came the moment that will haunt Northern throughout the off-season. Paul Rook stealing the ball, Leighton Campbell stealing the win. Curry now plays Cessnock in Saturday's elimination semi, while Lakes meet the Rosellas on Sunday. Hamilton has seen a lot of its home ground of late. Two of its semi-finals played here went into extra time thrillers. We got there uh, just on a little bit of determination and good work. Despite finishing level on the ladder, minor premies Edgeworth on the favourites tag given its attacking potency. In fact, coach Bob Newmov has to decide whether to start hat-trick hero of the major semi-final in Wayne Bailey or recent breaker signing Daniel McBreen. This has probably been the most difficult on the coaching point of view that um, for me making decisions can be the most difficult because obviously someone's going to be left out but I'd like to think that everyone's going to play their part. However, one thing the Eagles don't have is grand final experience. Edgeworth haven't made it before. Um, they've always sort of been there and just seem to fall. But our team seem to rally sort of these situations and uh, we seem to go from strength to strength. It didn't seem to bother the Eagles had a get-together last night, but the wave of expectation is high. I think grand final's a one-off day. I don't think you ever worry about what's been happening throughout the season. I think it's just turning up on the day, being prepared to, to battle hard, and obviously it's going to be intense. Meanwhile, Curry heads to Cessnock for its third match in a week to play Newcastle Rugby League's elimination semi-final, which could be Steve Crow's last as a player coach. Well, this is my last season, so whenever Curry plays his last game, hopefully I'll be on, on deck playing because it'll be my last game as well. So, yeah, if they keep winning, who knows how far we'll go. Blakes United play West in the other semi-final on Sunday. While all eyes will be on who grabs third and fourth spot in the final round of the Newcastle Rugby Union's regular season, four teams are within five points on the ladder. These riders have countless titles to their credit, but for guys used to going places fast, their rise up the motorsport ranks isn't coming quick enough. Kevin Curtin is a perfect example, having just won his third straight outright Formula Extreme title, it's overseas teams chasing him. 
Vic AM Racing in Belgium definitely want me for next year, uh, but there's a lot of things I've got to sort out here, and I've got my contract to fulfil for the rest of the year. Warren Watson is an emerging star of the sport after taking the number one spot in the Formula Extreme Thunder class. While the Stafer brothers are making separate bids on overseas rides, older brother Daniel leads the Asian road racing series but must juggle his work commitments with Impulse Airlines with riding. If we can somehow manage the both to, to fit in you know, along the lines, I'll, I'll be really happy, but uh, I think it's going to come a point in a year or two where we might have to sort of make a decision there. While Jamie has just won the Australian Aprilla series and should now pick up a range of test rides overseas. It means a lot of exposure. Um, if I can go good on the bike, well, you know, they, they might pick me up and I might get a ride somewhere. Jim Callanan, NBN News. It was a case of swim first and answer questions later for the Dutch. Security cameras, the only ones to catch the Olympic team in the water today. The first session in Newcastle for their Olympic preparation. We do realise that there's a lot of pressure on the team and that's one of the reasons why uh, we, don't, we don't want to put extra pressure on it. Only arriving last night, the team looked far from worried today. But that's about all Inga de Bruin was allowed to say on camera today. We need a couple of days just to uh, get used to uh, the time uh, difference. The 26-year-old set the swimming world alight this year with smashing good looks and world records. She holds the 50 and 100 metre world marks in both freestyle and butterfly. It was amazing for us as well because you don't expect someone who's in our training uh, to swim that fast. Her efforts also drew that pretty sus comment from Australia's Susie O'Neill, who's since apologised. It was a bit of a disappointment, you know, because you, you don't expect uh, something like Susie to say something like that. But, you know, uh, they made it up. Uh, Susie sent an email and uh, they spoke to each other and, uh, well, that's it for us. The team of 24 also includes Peter van der Hugenbaard, who has strong gold medal chances in the 1 and 200 metre freestyle. The team will train in Newcastle right up until the Games. Newcastle Knights coach Warren Ryan doesn't have the fondest of memories of that match, but he's sure he's got the team to win it this time around. Is this is the highest, the, you know, the most skilled team I've ever coached. And he knows the team will need every bit of it against the Roosters. While Newcastle easily accounted for them the last time they met, the Roosters were without Adrian Lamb. Lamb being back in, he wasn't in when we beat them here. Lamb is an enormously important player to them. He's at you all the time. Forced to leave training early yesterday, Peter Shields played down his back problems today. The departure of many nights at the end of the year, though, including himself, has players pumped for a big finish. These blokes have got to take that opportunity because, um, you know, you never know when you're going to get that opportunity again. With Shields off to St Helens next season, there had been speculation teammate Glenn Grief may join him in England. I spoke to him today and I asked him today and he, he was he, he's staying here in Newcastle. Grief missed the start in the 17-man strong side to play Sydney on Saturday. In fact, the team is unchanged from the one that beat Melbourne. The only concern is second rower Ben Kennedy, who continues to battle on with an ankle injury. He's just played and played and played and just defied them to, to put him out. And uh, he's basically doing the same again. Jim Callanan, NBN News. It's the business end of the season with two games between the Hunters and Premier League glory. On Saturday night, they'll play North Sydney in an effort to make Sunday's final. The two teams won all after the regular rounds. But with ex-NBL stars like Ben Melmoth, Butch Hayes and Tony Jensen, the Hunters should come through. Probably one of the better seasons that we've had uh, ever, I suppose. Uh, but we've got some pretty good calibre players there and, and everyone's got a lot of experience. Meanwhile, some of the region's Olympic athletes and Olympic hopefuls received a timely financial boost today, courtesy of the Greater Youth Fund. Among the recipients of the $1,000 scholarships were swimmer Justin Norris and softballer Natalie Ward. However, none of the athletes were there in person. All are too busy training. Here's the pain. As I said, the effort that goes into a premiership campaign, only those that go through it know it. The Knights will now have to wait for next season to win a premiership. And also make it through to the grand final. Kyle Glenn McLeod, NBN News. 
Minor Premier's Edgeworth had scored more goals than any other team this season and by the way they started the grand final, you thought the trend would continue. But it was Olympic first on the board. A short corner and a Peter McGuinness cross started things while Craig Walwork finished it with a left foot drive. Olympic's defence then stepped in as well when Edgeworth went on the attack. The frustration grew. Even skipper Danny Gordon was guilty of going too far, picking up a yellow card. Hamilton scored just where it counted, with Corey flips of its goal sending the team into party mode just before half time. The second half was one of missed opportunities for the Eagles and growing frustration. Bookings about the only thing racked up by Edgeworth. For Olympics, Stu McAteer, he'd barely made his way off the bench and he was on the score sheet. Hamilton's third goal securing a hat-trick of titles for the team and a big night of celebration. The Newcastle Hunters were right up against their rivals. Because of that, the, um, the Hunters scored a lot of goals and did a lot of slam dunks. Also, Newcastle managed to win the game. And also the big one. Conklin, Conklin McLeod. NBA News. Finland has one of the prettiest landscapes in the world, and unfortunately Michael Guest had too close a look on the second stage of the rally. The Australian was forced to drive the best part of three stages with no nose and no turbo. A minor mechanical miracle later, and he was back on the road, but car troubles saw him finish day one in 54th outright. The second, though, was far better. Guest worked his way up to 36 through careful but quick driving. He even set a top 10 stage time in the afternoon. By the end of the third and final day, he was 30th, and after seeing dozens of his fellow competitors go out, just glad to finish. Wasn't looking that good there um, at the end of uh, special stage two early on in the rally when we wore up the front off the car, and you know it just goes to show how important it is to have a fantastic team behind you. Guess next event is at San Remo in October. Colin Baldwin, NBN News. The Players Association has been monitoring the ownership situation at the Breakers almost on a daily basis. But now David Hall is back in control, it's taken formal action to make sure players get what they're owed. Outstanding superannuation payments, believed to be around $60,000 in total, and other entitlements, head their concerns. If players don't get paid in seven days, they can proceed in terminating their contracts. Some players will probably pay for their, pay for their wages. Um, other people don't want to be involved with it. The association will meet with players tomorrow night to see what more they can do. The news comes just five days from the Breakers' first trial match against the Parramatta Eagles. I've got a, a really good program in place and it's going along uh, fine. And uh, just all this off-field stuff, we just, you know, it's just the only heartache we've got. Jim Callanan, NBN News. Cardiff is certainly no stranger to grand finals. In fact, this will be the Hawks' fourth in as many years. But that doesn't mean they don't feel the jitters that come with such big games. Oh, yeah, yeah. Always nervous. You've got to be nervous before a grand final in particular. But even more rides on tomorrow's decider, given it's the first against the Central Coast side and the first time the Black Diamond Cup may leave its Newcastle home. Well, I believe it's the oldest sporting trophy in Australia, so it's, it's pretty special in that respect, and uh, we're certainly looking forward to bringing it back to the Central Coast. Terrigal Avoca has had the wood on Cardiff in their last two outings, but with the Hawks playing at home, the Newcastle side will have a huge crowd in their corner. It's got to be an advantage to us, I guess, to be, or hopefully have all of, uh, certainly all of Newcastle and certainly all of Cardiff supporting us. Yeah. The match starts at 2.10 tomorrow at the number one sports ground. It's the last round of the Newcastle Rugby League's regular season and action kicks off tonight at Cessnock. There are three games tomorrow, the best at Waratah, while the Northern Blues will be fighting for a top five spot against Lakes United on Sunday. Western Suburbs, though, will be without centre Gavin Cook for two games after he was suspended last night for a high tackle.
The minor premiership could well be decided tomorrow in Newcastle Rugby Union, with the Wanderers taking on ladder leaders Eastern Districts in the feature match of the round. And Hamilton and Cessnock will fight it out on Sunday in the NBN Soccer League preliminary final for the right to play Edgeworth in the decider. The Cowie and Walter Mayfield were both at it again and because of that um, uh, uh, Walter Mayfield scored because of that Cowie's finals hopes and chances as well as their season came to an end. Carl Glenn McLeod, NBN News. Cessnock and Hamilton's last match was a real arm wrestle, a one-all draw that led to a penalty shootout, and the early signs looked to follow the same script. Ben Lane had the first real chance of the match when he grabbed a second chance from a free kick, but Cessnock keeper Peter Oberhauser stopped that. So too at the other end with Liam Baker saving a Tony Bauer blast from point-blank range. The shots kept coming Oberhauser's way, with Olympic enjoying plenty of chances, but no glory. While it was nil all at the break, Trent Austin did get on the booking sheet before half-time. Not long after the break, he got on the scorer's list, with a great strike that was simply unstoppable. Hamilton hung on to a one-goal lead for all but the last two minutes of regular time. The Hornets stung one back after Neville Smith's cross lured Baker out of goal, only for the ball to fall perfectly for Craig Beckett, and it was into extra time again. Well into that, replacement Stu McAteer headed home the golden goal that takes Olympic into the grand final against Edgeworth. A local derby for the decider, but both sides had trouble coming to grips with the wet weather. No such problems in defence. If you can't go through them, go over them. And when a Kevin Watts bomb finished with Wayne Headley, Scone was on the board after just a few minutes. But a second look raises some questions about a possible knock-on. The rest of the half was about drop balls, driving tackles and more big hits while a Stephen Bridge penalty goal made it 4-2 at the break. The second half started like the first with the scone try, but there was nothing questionable about Dean Taylor's four-pointer. And when Adam Frost found Jade Smith out wide, scone was in again and holding a 10-point lead. Defence continued to highlight. But as time wore on, so did player frustration. Simon Irving's tackle turning into a wrestle. Irving and Taylor spent the last few minutes of the match in the sin bin as the hits kept coming on field. But it was Scone's day winning 12-2. Man of the match and Scone captain coach Khan Gleeson lifting the Thoroughbreds third title in a row and its sixth in seven years. Having it is always great to play. It's always going to be a hard game, local derby. And I'm just happy to be winners, you know, it's great. His counterpart, however, will now hang up the boots. There's other things apart from football that you, you want to concentrate on. And Jim Callanan, NBN News. The same thoughts are shared by the Newcastle Knights, but you won't hear any talk of a grand final. The team are treating this match the same as the last, taking it one game at a time. These guys are very, very much mentally on the job. They're, they're very, very good. There's not... You know, you, you don't have to go around ringing alarm bells and that. They will, they can all count to ten, these guys. They're smart, they're smart kids. An interested observer of the Roosters' win, Knights coach Warren Ryan was back busy preparing his team to take on Sydney today and the usual suspects feature in his game plans. We were, yeah, we were talking about scrums and how to defend, the, you know, the opposition and what, you know, what we do and what we, you know, what we think they may do. So naturally, Fitler's name and Lamb, you know, were mentioned. Peter Shields left training early with some trouble with his back, but it's not considered a major concern. Winger Tamana Tahu trained strongly after missing a weekend session, while Ben Kennedy continues to carry that ankle injury. But he's out there and he's doing everything. He's stoically training without painkillers, but he'll play with one. And Tamana looked okay today. We rested him late last week because he had a bit of a twinge in the, in the hammy. 
The team to play the Roosters will be named tomorrow, but no changes are expected to the side that beat Melbourne. When the Newcastle earthquake struck 11 years ago, it caused widespread destruction. Geologists now believe they've found the fault that's likely to have caused it. It uh, is located off uh, Lake Macquarie and it stretches to the northwest and projects straight towards the centre of Newcastle. Researchers at the University of Newcastle mapped the layers beneath the ocean floor using radio sounding in 1993, finding only one fault. Now, two years of research by Queensland University of Technology researcher Dr Gary Huftile backs up the single fault theory. And so we have exhaustively searched uh, for those other faults and found none. And so therefore, this, it's just this fault that's offshore of uh, Lake Macquarie uh, that is a, a danger to Newcastle. He says only 20% of the fault has been ruptured, leaving the potential for more earthquakes of greater intensity in Newcastle. You've got a geologic reason to be worried, and, and you prepare the best you can, and then you write it up. However, Newcastle Council says lessons learned following the 89 quake mean the city and its people will be better prepared if it happens again. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Even on the sideline, the Chief is imposing, but the Knights are a different team to the 97 title winners. A real mixture of youth and experience, as most believing the team is ready. These young blokes now, you know, they're not only talented, but they're very sort of, they're with it upstairs, you know, they're mentally tough, and they realise that they're des as desperate to win it as myself and Butts are, so that, you know, that's fantastic. The 5'8th looking forward to a personal battle with Brad Fittler in what will probably be his last encounter with one of league's best. If you aren't disciplined in the build-up, you know, and, and, you, don't, and you, don't, you go there and you aren't playing at your best, then individually you're going to be embarrassed. Ben Kennedy will be carrying his troublesome ankle injury. Obviously it slows me up a bit through the week and uh, once I get to the game, get a couple of needles, it's, it's 100%. While Andrew Johns admits he's had plenty of nerves thinking about the game to the point where he's had trouble sleeping. Just know that uh, it's a big game and we're probably 80, 80 minutes away from the grand final. And you, don't really, you really don't know how many grand finals you're going to play. You know, this could be the last chance to play one, so you've got to make the most of it. Today's Excalibur Club lunch was more like a wake than a celebration, given the weekend's disappointment. Some good news with hooker Danny Baderis named in the Australian World Cup train-on squad. In all, five knights were named with Andrew Johns, Matthew Gidley, Adam McDougall and Ben Kennedy also in the squad. But it's next season that incoming coach Michael Hagen has to now prepare for. I think we've all finished a week earlier than we anticipated, so um, it's going to take a little while to, to come to grips with that. Prop Paul Rahihi and winger Lenny Beckett are still to be signed, but the chances of getting both aren't great. Well, I don't know if we're all that confident given that other clubs are showing interest and they've got families and they've got decisions to make on their future. But um, if we can come up with something that will entice them to stay, we'll, we'll do our level best to do that. And capping off a fine year and career in Australia, Prop Day fairly won the Excalibur Club's first grade player of the year. First division was jointly awarded to Ben Donaldson and Daniel Abraham. When Stu McAteer nailed Olympic's third goal, it also sealed Hamilton's third NBN Soccer League title in a row and sparked huge celebrations. Captain Ben Lane added the Man of the Match award to his Player of the Year title, while coach Greg Smith secured his third straight title as coach. Hamilton now have the chance to be the first side since the 1970s to win four titles in a row. The Newcastle Hunters basketball team is also crowing after wrapping up the state Premier League title against Sutherland, 116-93 to at the weekend. But for Tui's Cup Rugby League, it's semi-final time. The minor will be played on Friday night between West and Cessnock. Waratah and Lakes meet in the Major on Saturday. And the Wanderers will play Eastern Districts in the NRU Major semi-final after finishing the regular season as minor premiers. The Waratahs and Singleton also snuck into next weekend's semi-finals. All begetting the, uh, all begetting the best touches, of course, uh, was of course, uh, was of course the, uh, was of course the best swimming teams of all when they came to 
won the best swimming centers in Newcastle today. And of course, it was part of promoting the Sydney Olympics, which starts in about the next couple of weeks. <laughs> and of course, while swimming is arguably their best, winning medals is also onto their minds. And of course, and of course, and of course, the best hunter swimmers include. And of course, the best hunter swimmers include Justin Norris and a few more others. Um, are of course into the Sydney Olympics. It comes after after Norris secured a huge, victorious one. He won a few medals right up in both the one hundred and two hundred meters. Finishing in straight into first. Conklin McLeod, MBN News. It was an emotional one. Um, as everyone quickly gathered to bid an emotional farewell to, to Mr. Butts himself, Tony Butterfield. Mm. Uh, after a 13 year career with the Knights. And also, it was time to say goodbye to um, uh, to Matthew Johns as well. Conklin McLeod, MBN News. Uh, with a night's nice merchandise up at her house, it, with a night's nice merchandise up at her house, it's become huge for um, uh, for one extraordinary night's fan. And of course, she's been supporting the red and blue since day one back in 1988. Conklin McLeod, MBN News. <laughs> the last time that Newcastle beat the Roosters up at right up at Marathon Stadium, it was back in June. Then Newcastle led right straight on eighteen to fourteen. Before Newcastle gained on the first points. And of course, Tamana Tahu now knows what he'll have to wait for next season, which will be 2001. Darren Albert was part of the Knights match winning. Darren Albert was part of the Knights premiership winning side back in 1997 and eventually scored his own back in the preliminary final loss to the Roosters over the weekend. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. The future was a bit unsure for the Newcastle Breakers. And of course, their coach had to quickly reveal why. And of course, their new name is now Newcastle United. Conklin McLeod, 
NBN News. On the field, Danny Badiris is usually on to his best by scoring tries. And that of course is with the new is with the Newcastle Knights. But off the field he's always on he always goes for a lot of walks. But of course, Badiris was part of that heartbreaking loss to the Roosters in the preliminary final over the weekend. And he says that next season, which is the 2001 season, is the one that he cannot wait for. And of course, Badiris has scored more tries. And of course, he scored one against Parramatta. Then, in the Knights, um, then in the Knights home elimination semi-final against the Storm, for which the Knights won. Now, the Knights will have to wait next season. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Tony Abbott, of course, um, uh, went inside Maitland Jail as a visitor. And also, it was all because... Um, it was all because he had to go and visit the uh, uh, the former place uh, for which closed back in 1998. Mr. Abbott is, of course, in the Hunter region as uh, as part of its as part of its use of uh, of jails, and also since then, Maitland Jail has become a well-known attraction for both film and TV. Also, it's become huge, and it's also a visiting attraction as well. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. It was great to see my old mate, Tony Butterfield, up on the stage enjoying himself in his testimonial tribute. There were plenty of familiar faces, but his old teammates, family and friends, but from my eyes, what it did, and I'm sure the crowd of more than 2,000 people felt the same way, is that it triggered a lot of emotions about this year's campaign of winning the grand final. And on that, the Knights have left no stone unturned with their preparations this week, a culmination of excitement and a little bit of nervousness, but watching them train, I couldn't be any more confident of the way things are going. Now that Canberra and Penrith have left the scene, we're left with two great games, starting with Saturday night's clash between the Knights and the Roosters. Look, everyone knows that the Roosters have a great home record this year and the Knights do have trouble winning at night, but I don't think any statistics or home ground advantage will stop the boys. Don't forget St Francis Xavier College is in the final of the Newtrick Grain Cup, which will start at 4 o'clock and it's the first time a Newcastle school has made the final. So it'll be great to see these two teams win, the Newcastle Knights and Francis Xavier on the big day. Parramatta's run of success will be more than tested on Sunday at Stadium Australia. The aggressive and enthusiastic display which has seen them win six out of the last seven games, I think, will come to a full stop on Sunday because the qualities of experience and depth play a much greater role, I believe, in the big games. Brisbane will win this one and meet Newcastle, I think, in the grand final. What a great match that would be. Enjoy the weekend's games. I'll be back next week. Back to you, Rabs. No such problems for the Knights. In fact, the only real concern was Peter Shields, but his back problems seem well behind him. I was just a little bit sore yesterday at training, but uh, this morning has pulled up pretty good. In many respects, it's been a long two weeks for Newcastle, but that time has only been good for team bonding. Time away last week was followed with Tony Butterfield's testimonial night earlier this week, and they've both helped build a healthy atmosphere within the team. There's a real good feel in the team and uh, we're very close to one another again. There's a real feel like we had in 97. We're like one big family. But one thing the fullback doesn't want is to see bad weather. I'm not too happy about the, the wet weather. Obviously, it makes my job a little bit more difficult back there. All fullbacks could probably tell you that they prefer a dry track. But, uh, yeah, it's just something I have to cope with. Given it's the biggest game ever for some of his younger teammates, the 1997 grand final veteran can't wait to play. It's probably the most exciting time uh, before the game and once you're out there you've just got to enjoy it. It's not something you should uh, be apprehensive about. Coverage live on NBN tomorrow night from 7.30.
With eight titles to their credit, St Gregory's carried the weight of a school's expectation into their 10th finals appearance. In contrast, it was the first time a Newcastle team had reached the final. But a sad start for Daniel Christian, whose missed time tackle saw him take a trip on the Medicab. Errors and the frustrations that come with them highlighted the opening few minutes. But so was the class. Chris Potter, son of St George great Mick, turned defence into attack in the blink of an eye. Joel Rawlins, lucky not to be in the sin bin after his effort, did save us and Greg's try. Denied once, but not twice, Riley Mullins' boot found just enough space for Luke Hessian to score the first. Mullins added the extras from the touchline, before another made it 8-0 at half-time. Desperate defence denied St Greg's a try shortly after the break, but the Sydney school was having the better of the day, and David Howe's try made it 12-0. The Newcastle school's last chance turned into their finish. The desperation to get onto the board provided Luke Hessian with a double and the trophy was back to St Greg's for the first time since 1993. It was a, it was a qualifying... It was an elimination semi-final of Newcastle Rugby League. It was between Kali Kali and Cessnock. Meanwhile, things is me. Meanwhile, um, things went ugly when a lot of punches were thrown. Cessnock scored, and also Cessnock will now have to wake off to quickly go through to the sem. Meanwhile, Cessnock will go through to next week's semi final. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Both Lakes United and Western Suburbs had a qualifying semi-final on Sunday. And because of that, Lakes United were the first to score. With Wild Time Mayfield having to buy, it was of course for their own good. And of course, it was just massive. But then the best moment came. Uh, Lakes United securing a win by scoring more tries. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Gone with the normal red and blues, Mad Monday has its traditional dress as well, and it's mostly about finding the most outlandish gear. But no matter how bright they looked, the mood was hardly colourful. Yeah, I don't think it's any easier now than it was after the game. Um, you know, still really disappointing. But... Leading 16-2 and with a grand final in sight, the team went down by six. The toughest thing for most, though, was the disappointment for those leaving the club. Just to see the look on Butchies and Matty's face at the end after they spent so long with the club and, and to be, um, you know, that let down, that, that, that upset about it. So, um, you know, I think everyone felt, you know, very badly for him. That's probably the hardest thing for me to take, you know, is, is emotional. You know, not being able to get there next week for emotions. As for the coming few weeks, their minds are far from football. Didn't like watching the game yesterday, only saw snatches of it. And um, so I don't think any of us are real happy about watching it and probably won't watch it next weekend either. Jim Callanan, NBN News. Shooting hit the spotlight in Australia at the last games, given the team's spectacular medal haul. For Guatemala, its few hopes for their first ever Olympic medal hinges heavily on its shooting team and Sergio Sanchez. A former pentathlete, Sergio, is in Newcastle training ahead of the games, happy to be away from distractions and expectations of his countrymen. The most important thing from now to the Olympic Games is my head. So technically, um, I've, I know shooting, but psychologically is a thing, yeah. Sydney will be the 29-year-old's third Olympics, and after finishing eighth at Atlanta in 96 in the free pistol, he hopes to make it onto the podium this time around. The psychological factor is the most important, yeah? Between those 25 shooters who's coming in his day and who can keep his nerves and, uh, and everything else together, he'll win. Australian hammer thrower Karen Perkins, meanwhile, is headed to the appeals tribunal after only gaining conditional selection for the games. The Newcastle-born and bred athlete won the qualifying meet but didn't reach the qualifying distance and must do so before September 10 to make the team. 
There's nothing left for hurdler Jackie Munro, however, after a tension-filled start to her final that included two false starts by other runners, the teenager finished second, missing an Olympic spot by a mere 0.16 seconds. There is little Steve Merrick hasn't achieved in his rugby union career and after hinting at it for several seasons, the former Wallaby scrum half will retire at the season's end. And what a way to wrap up his playing days with Singleton than by winning the best and fairest for the Newcastle competition. The Anderson medal was presented to him by another former Australian rep, Andrew Blades, last night. <laughs> Another premiership could cap off the perfect farewell, but there is stiff competition. The Wanderers last night added the Hawthorne Cup to the minor premiership it secured at the weekend and are favourites for the title. Meanwhile, the Newcastle Rugby League, Cessnock is set to appeal the four-week suspension of Kane Bradley. The Goanna star halfback was outed for biting ahead of the sudden death semi-final against Western Suburbs on Friday night. Later, Employment Minister Abbott took a shot at getting visitors to Fort Scratchley. He announced $40,000 for a master plan. Not exactly for jobs, but East End tourism. The idea is to give all visitors to the Hunter region a taste of Newcastle's uh, past, uh, as well as of its present. The Lord Mayor wants to put together a comprehensive study on turning features like Fort Scratchley, the Foreshore, Nobby's Lighthouse and the historical convict lumber yard into a combined attraction called Coal River. The money will go towards developing that and then we'll obviously be seeking more funding in due course but we need to put the information together to achieve that. But he realises there's much work to be done cleaning up areas of Newcastle like the West End so that facilities are good enough to keep visitors coming back. He says council's last budget set aside money for city presentation in the hope of attracting more accommodation and visitors. Make Newcastle look tidier, cleaner, crisper, work better presented and bring the, develop the draw cards that are here into a package and when we've got all that together obviously we've got something that can be marketed very, very very strongly. It's Olympic fever up in Newcastle today. Because of that, it's where celebrations will, uh, will continue. When you think coming. of the torch route which comes in through Hexham, Walls End, Hamilton, and through the city, um, you could be talking about many, many, many thousands more. It's part of the upcoming torch relay which will start on August the 27th. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Discipline cost Waratah two points early, but skill got them the lead, with Michael Varnum finishing off some great lead-up work. That stung Lakes into action, scoring two tries in quick time to open a 14-4 break. The second try a brotherly affair, with Adam Hall dishing off to Chris in the corner. The Cheetahs clawed the margin back to six when Frank Barrett found Craig Foggo at the other end. But running into Adam Hall was a different story, and soon everyone was getting up close and personal. When the dust finally did settle, the Seagulls racked up 26 unanswered second-half points and a grand final berth. Waratah now play West for a second chance of reaching the decider after the Rosellas beat Cessnock in a battle royal last night. Little separated the two in the first half. A try to Ryan Daggle had the home side up 4-2 before Shane Saunders grabbed a two-point lead for Cessnock on the stroke of half-time with a characteristic try for the fullback made against the run of play. On a cool night, things heated up in the middle. There was definitely no love lost between these two sides. Anthony Pauling and Saunders given time in the sin bin after this. But West landed a triple combination that knocked Cessnock out of the title race. Tries to Gavin Cook, another for Hooker Dagwell, and one to fullback Kurt Storworthy sealed an 18-6 win for the Premiers and an end to Cessnock's season. Anderson medal winner Steve Merrick started the elimination semi-final knowing it could well be his last game. And the Waratahs were out to make sure of it, with Dan McGovern racing over to make it 5-0. Singleton booted itself onto the board via a penalty. 
but McGovern liked doing it his way. The winger over again, and Waratah kicked away to a seven-point lead. The Bulls bounce back once again. A clever switch of play, and centre Scott Deliverzek did the rest as Singleton drew level. Already with a double, McGovern dined out again on good Waratah lead-up work to score his third five-pointer. It was like a terrible case of deja vu for the Bulls. As the winger ran right on the right-hand side, McGovern in for his fourth and Waratah was up 20 points to 10. In an open match, Singleton continued to chance its arm and found just enough room to land their second try in the corner. Both teams traded tries after the break as well, but Waratah got the money, winning 30 to 20. They'll now play Eastern Districts for the chance to reach the grand final. Paul Rahihi says leaving Newcastle was the last thing he wanted to do, but providing for family comes first. I was quite surprised how much um, the emotion that you know played on me over the last week or so, trying to make a decision. I've, I've had a few sleepless nights and. Just thinking about leaving us has, has been really tough. Signing on for two years with the Bulldogs, the big Kiwi won't forget how Newcastle plucked him from the obscurity of Melbourne's feeder club last year. All the feeling he got when he ran on to Marathon Stadium. Yeah, I've never experienced anything like that before, playing uh, in front of such a great supporter base in there. And, and my little fan club there, you know, they, they've really helped me lift my game. His now ex-teammate Ben Kennedy, meanwhile, is contemplating a new jumper as well, that of the green and gold variety. Individually, you know, this is probably the greatest honour you could ever get, especially in the World Cup. It probably doesn't get any better than that. Australian selection caps off what's been a year of highs and lows, which included serious injury, state of origin success and the finals disappointment. With all that behind him, the big back rower just wants to make sure his troublesome ankle is right before the World Cup tour that starts in October. I went for a bit of a run yesterday, I was a little bit sore, but I, I, I'm pretty certain we'll get through a medical. Jim Callanan, NBN News. And the people of the Hunter gave the torch a warm welcome back. The main street of Morissette was a sea of people, all hoping to catch a glimpse of the flame. People even making the most of the shop's vantage points to get a bird's eye view. And awaiting his turn to carry the Olympic torch, wheelchair-bound James Sidebottom knows that it would take a lot to beat the experience of being a torch bearer. Uh, at my 18th birthday, I'm going to try and skydive, so this would probably be the only thing that would top this. When the magic moment arrived, John Johnson lit the torch of the young bearer to the cheer of an approving crowd. And he voiced the opinion of most bearers when asked whether he'd keep his Olympic torch. I wouldn't let it go for anything. After Morissette, the flame continued its journey north along Lake Macquarie, passing through Dora Creek on its way to Toronto. It's been one apiece for Cessnock and West this season, but past performances mean little heading into tonight's Tui's Cup Rugby League semi-final. What does help the Premier's cause, though, is the return of centre Gavin Cook from suspension. He's um, a great player, Cook. You know, I just like uh, his presence on the field. It does it does change for the other side. I mean, what he can do in, in attack and defence is um, great, and he lifts the side. However, Cessnock has lost its appeal against its star halfback Kane Bradley suspension, which only further strengthens the Rosellas' chances. No, we were all smiles during the week. Um, I didn't actually know about it until Tuesday, and um, yeah, it's good news for us. For Skovgaard, though, he's feeling the pressure of his first year as captain coach and admits the pressure is building. This week's been pretty um, tense for me, and I mean, like as you can imagine, like if um, we bear out this week, it's, it's a major disappointment. You know? It's semi-final time in Newcastle Rugby Union this weekend as well, with the major semi-final tomorrow between the Wanderers and Eastern Districts. On Sunday, it's do or die for the Waratahs and Singleton. Under the cover of darkness, but with a sea of blue balloons as a guide, the Olympic flame made its way through Tuncurry and into South Street Oval. Former Olympian Lorraine Thurlow lit the community cauldron, igniting the Olympic spirit in the thousands of people who gathered there. Great Lakes Mayor John Chadban pledged his support on behalf of the community before a fireworks display lit up the night sky as part of the celebrations. From there, the torch relay continued its southward journey. This morning, hundreds of people 
people lined the Pacific Highway at Karua. Anticipation became reality for local torchbearers, clearly thrilled to have the spirit of the games in their hands. From Karua on to Raymond Terrace, and emotion overflowed when 1948 Olympian Hugh Lambie carried the torch for Port Stephens. But this was a moment for everyone. Once in a lifetime experience and uh, you can't take it away from me. It's just absolutely fabulous to be here. It's very emotional. Meanwhile, in Newcastle, a crowd was already gathering in anticipation of the special arrival. 50,000 people are expected to converge on the foreshore for the state's biggest reception so far. Just before 7 o'clock, the Olympic torch will arrive here. Four times world surfing champion Mark Richards will light the community cauldron, leading into an evening's entertainment. Brooke Webster, NBN News. After snagging one of the few prizes left for Adam McDougall to claim, the winger was a happy man today. We won a grand final and played an Origin Series now, and, and to play for Australia, it's really the icing on the cake for my football career. But there's still challenges ahead for him, namely nailing a starting spot. There's only, um, you know, seven outside backs picked for six positions, so, uh, you know, I don't want to be the odd man out. Ben Kennedy's selection comes after an incredible year, which included that state of origin success and a major ankle injury. Together with Andrew Johns and Matthew Gidley, there are four nights all up. The whole thing, the camp's great, and even trained amongst the best players in the, in the whole competition, and, you know, just learning different things about different players and different coaches and stuff like that, and, and the whole thing about travelling away and, and playing together, it's, you know, it's just a great experience. Meanwhile, late today, Paul Rahihi agreed to a two-year deal with the Bulldogs after Newcastle couldn't match the offer from the Sydney club. The big Kiwi forward is disappointed to leave, but said he simply couldn't refuse the Bulldogs' offer. And after retiring from football, Tony Butterfield will now head Lancom's crusade in the Hunter Valley. Described as the best of all, and of course, the torch relay continued right in Newcastle. Thanks to all the local people, yes! Of course, that's when all the parties started at night. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. For the sea of people who turned out, it'll long be remembered as the day the Olympic flame came to Maitland. An estimated 25,000 crammed into Maitland Park to watch 64-year-old retiree Dave Harwood carry the torch past thousands of newfound fans. With a welcome from above, he was escorted by Maitland student Clinton Modiger. Together, they ignited the city's cauldron. It was a case of history repeating for Dave Harwood. He carried the Olympic torch in 1956. Absolutely fantastic. It's difficult for words to describe it, uh, actually, but just coming through all those people and seeing all the happy faces. The torch then hit the streets of Maitland, again carried by a former Olympic torchbearer, John Lane, who carried it 44 years ago as a 16-year-old. From Maitland, the torch snaked its way up the Hunter Valley. At Lochinvar, hundreds of students went wild as the torch was carried westward along the Pacific Highway towards Greta and Brankston. Blake Doyle, NBN News. Would the Olympic flame uh, uh, carried on in the Hunter Valley still? It was just a spectacular success. And of course, thousands of fans cheered on as it made its way up towards the highway. Conklin McLeod, NBA News. There were few words to describe Waratah's performance against Lakes in the major semi final, but 5 8 Steve's story found some. It was embarrassing, humiliating, you know, we just. We just didn't really turn up ready to play, you know, and, uh, you know, we have to improve on that 300% to even get near West. 
Voted the league's player of the season, Story was also voted player's player, while his coach Steve Henderson was named coach of the year. Accolades, that'll mean little if they lose on Sunday. I'd much prefer to give them back and, and do a lap of honour around uh, number one in a couple of weeks. First things first, and that means beating West, a team used to final success. In fact, Story's workmate, Anthony Pauling, will be one of the Rosellas out to make sure the cheetah season comes to an end. Oh, yeah, it's pretty good. We're pretty quiet about it, really. Haven't said a great deal. Kept to ourselves, pretty much. West wasn't at its best against Cessnock last weekend, while a few players had to pass fitness tests last night just to make the team. That included the West lock, who has a slight hand injury. Yeah, there'll be no worries there, Jimmy. The match will be played at number one sports ground on Sunday. Meanwhile, old rivals, the Waratahs and Eastern Districts, will play off in Newcastle Rugby Union's preliminary final tomorrow. The winner will meet the Wanderers in the grand final. An appointment at the physiotherapist seems like a fair thing when you've just blitzed the world's best young swimmers. Alyssa Searston is ensuring her winning form continues with a bit of preventative attention. The 15-year-old has just returned home from Edinburgh in Scotland, where she competed at the first ever Commonwealth Youth Games for swimmers under 18. And there's a certain glow about her. Alyssa won gold in the 400-metre individual medley, the 200 backstroke and the 4x100 medley relay, and she brought home bronze in the 100 backstroke excited <laughs> they played the national anthem after our race and that was pretty good <laughs> Although she competed against others from around the world up to three years her senior, Alyssa says it made no difference. I didn't take any notice, so they're just like you, just nice people. Back in May, Alyssa trialled for the Sydney 2000 Games. She wasn't selected, but isn't disappointed. No, not really. It was my first time that I've ever been to like, that competition. So it was just a great feeling to be there and mix with them sort of people. Catherine Turner, NBN News. A first-class venue for first-class athletes. More than a 1,000 of the Hunter region's best track and field athletes converged on Glendow's Athletic Centre today. They're competing for about 250 places in the New South Wales Combined High School's athletics team. And the records came tumbling down, 14 in all, including the 13 and 15 years girls' 200 metres... And the 13 years girls high jump. The team will be announced in about a fortnight. One standout competitor is Rutherford's Jackie Hodges. Ten days ago, she tried out for the World Junior Championships in the heptathlon, but just missed out. That was one of my goals from the start of the year to make the World Junior team. So in that respect, it was a little bit disappointing, but um, it was a good performance and I can't really complain. Catherine Turner, NBN News. Well, I think we're all a little bit shell-shocked and a bit empty after the night's loss last week. I know the town is a little bit the same. And the boys are disappointed and they feel a certain amount of responsibility at letting their supporters down, which is certainly not the case. That second half last week was unexpected and hard to accept. But next year is a changing of the guards while Ryan leaves the scene and a fresh opportunity for Michael Hagan to take over. Several players are leaving while others are getting a fresh start. Now, what was an opportunity missed by Newcastle is one taken by the Roosters, who have proved an upset against Brisbane, could still be there considering the last time these two teams clashed was in round 26. It was the Roosters who came out 28 to nil. Now, the Roosters team have good character. We saw last week that they came back, and the same could happen again. You don't have to be a genius to work out that Freddie Fidler is the key in this department. I've played with him many occasions in State of Origin and Australia, and I can tell you I've never seen him turn it up or be overawed. He's mentally tough, and he always performs in the big ones. Well, statistics are not the be-all, the end-all, but they can paint a fairly accurate picture. The Broncos won the minor premiership by an equal record margin this year, and the Roosters finished second, and that's the way I see the grand final going. Brisbane have never lost a grand final. There's still plenty of reason for them to win, including World Cup selection for the players. But when it's all said and done, it would be nice to see the Roosters win a grand final, which has eluded them for the past 25 years. And I'm sure the town of Sydney is right behind them, which can only help. My tips for big performances in the grand final are Ryan Cross, Anthony Minicello, Brad Fittler, Gordon Tallis, Brad Thorne and Wendell Saylor. That's the year of Rugby League in 2000. It's certainly gone very, very quick. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Tomorrow night, four-time surfing world champion and proud Novocastrian Mark Richards will have the honour of lighting the Olympic cauldron in Foreshore Park. 
And then to find out that I was like the last runner running into the foreshore and, and lighting the cauldron was, um, was incredible. I'm really excited about it. After arriving in Raymond Terrace at 1.30pm, the relay will run down Rees James Road, then the Pacific Highway, before turning into William Bailey Street. By 2, the flame will have been run alongside the Williams River for a lunchtime celebration at Sports Oval, which will include a RAF flyover. At about 3, the relay goes off again through Raymond Terrace, back onto the Pacific Highway. In the Lantern, the flame will travel over the Hunter River by car, arriving in Hexham at 3.50. Then, runners will take over again, turning off at Sandgate, down Walls End Road. After a 5pm break in Walls End, the torch will loop through the business district and head out onto Newcastle Road, through Jesmond and Lambton. Then, it's Griffiths Road, through Broadmeadow by 6, before a right turn down the cosmopolitan heart of Hamilton. After Tudor Street, the relay will join Hunter Street all the way to Watch Street and then left down Wharf Road and finally Foreshore Park. The entertainment will begin at 5pm but organisers recommend arriving around 3 if you want one of the best spots. There'll be singing, dancing and the lighting of the cauldron at 7 with fireworks to top off a special day. David McElwain, NBN News. Wyong had all four senior grades in the Deciders and few thought the entrance would break its premiership drought in the main game. But this premiership battle was all about who would be the last man standing. Blues and big hits highlighted the opening exchanges. Mark Bresselneck kicked the entrance onto the board while Wyong's first points also came from the boot. With a mistake offering Anthony Fenton a gift. Wyong blew another chance to score. But the Tigers didn't need any invitation. Steve Eckerparty crashing over in the corner. The big hits kept coming. And so did the tries. Christian Carisiano's effort gave the Tigers a 16-6 lead at half-time. Discipline went out the door for the ruse. And so did defence. Chris Oburn over and an upset was on the cards. 22-6 and needing something fast, Josh White answered Wyong's call with a try. But that's as pretty as things got for the ruse as the game began to get out of hand. The entrance, 24-10 winners and into celebration mode. At Toronto, the 15 torchbearers warmed up for the big event with a lap through the McDonald's drive through Then, in scenes repeated countless times throughout Australia, the footpath swelled with thousands of onlookers. The first to receive the Toronto torch, champion distance runner Angela Sheehan. Um, to be like the community representative for all these people here to run with it, I'm just studying. And what do you have to do with it? Not to not fall over? Not like fall that? over. Hopefully it won't go out. <laughs> but um, if it does, they tell me I can light it. <laughs> Down the boulevard and through the town, 14 other torchbearers began to guide the flame west towards the coal fields. The torch is now on the way to Cessnock, where celebrations begin in Turner Park at 7 o'clock tonight. Paul Lobb, NBN News. It's been a good amount of a run for the Newcastle Knights, demolishing the storm right up in round two this year, before hammering them in the first run of the finals. And of course, deliberating other teams as well. Now, Newcastle will have to wait for next season. to become finalists and premiers and also win the and are hoping to win the grand final next season. Conklin McLeod, MBN News. The competition is named after one of Australia's best ever players of our time, four-time Olympian Shannon Buchanan. And the best schoolgirl teams in the state were invited to play with selectors also on the lookout for new talent. 
Maitland Grossman High is one of the Hunters' best teams, but couldn't match the might of Lismore's Trinity College. Down 1-0 at halftime, Trinity banged home two more after the break to win by three. But it was the Lismore School's namesake from Goulburn that reached the final against Bathurst's Kelso High. Well known for its ability to produce hockey talent, Kelso soon lived up to its reputation, knocking home the first. Jodie Campbell was having a great day, and when she sent home a second, Kelso enjoyed a healthy lead at half-time. Campbell capped off a memorable final, scoring her third to wrap up successive Buchanan Cups for the Bathurst Base School. It was clear from the outskirts of the Hunter that this was going to be no ordinary reception for the torch relay. The people from Wall's End cramming into every vantage point to catch a glimpse of Olympic history. And it was a similar sight in Hamilton, one of the best softballers in the world and current Olympian Natalie Ward pitching in to share in the Olympic spirit as it passed through her hometown. I just got goosebumps straight away and it's just it's an amazing feeling. The spirit of the Games, too, wasn't lost on the Dean of Newcastle Torch recipient Graham Lawrence, keeping the flame alive as it made its way towards the heart of the city. The crowds on Hunter Street sharing a special moment as swimming coach Bill Nelson handed the torch to wheelchair-bound David Fairher. But the best was yet to come. The crowd swelling into the thousands along the foreshore as arguably the city's best known and loved Novocastrian made his way towards them. To actually, you know, run through thousands and thousands of Novocastrians and have them all sort of screaming their lungs out was just totally amazing. As the torch was put to bed a short time later, the sounds of friendly fire echoed over Newcastle, the cannons of Fort Scratchley blasting several shots, each one symbolising the five Olympic rings. The spectacle cited by Olympic officials as Australia's most impressive torch celebration so far capped off with a big bang as thousands celebrated into the night. An early start and early rain didn't deter spectators this morning either. The Olympic flame last left Newcastle City Hall 44 years ago. Fittingly, ex-Deputy Mayor Albert Henderson was chosen to do the honours today before a second generation of Novocastrians. The relay left the city via its famous beaches, people lining the streets and highways filled with the Olympic spirit, thousands of all shapes and sizes turning out in Charlestown alone. The same applied to the torchbearers. 12-year-old Dan Proud ran to do something special for his cancer-stricken father. Former Paralympian Robert Stadden was cheered on by hundreds at Warners Bay. Jeff Thomas, meanwhile, has battled melanoma and does invaluable work with the elderly. Today, he had the honour of lighting the cauldron in Spears Point Park. It was amazing to see the, the, the huge crowd out there. I'm not sure whether we did as well as Newcastle, but it's a lovely crowd and it's good to see the community drawn together by such a special event. The relay then continued along the shores of Lake Macquarie, people lining one of the narrowest local roads for a glimpse of one of the region's biggest heroes in Paul Harrigan, the man who once lifted the Optus Cup, now carrying the Olympic torch. All I know is this was an absolutely fantastic day. Good to share with my family and the that I grew up with too, so it's very special to me. And I want to thank everyone too for turning up Australia. A street parade at Belmont proved a fitting farewell for the flame as it headed to the central coast, the community wishing it a peaceful journey. Breaker's owner David Hall had until the close of business today to pay around $60,000 worth of outstanding payments or risk losing players. The missed payments come at a time where Hall is also trying to prove his solvency to Soccer Australia. For now, the players are sticking to preparations that started at the weekend. Sort of early days in us getting to know them and vice versa, um, them knowing the players that are around them as well, but certainly um, Sir Kenneth Surgeon and Massey all went very well and uh, they're certainly going to add a lot of quality to the team. 
Sturry will name a 16-man squad tomorrow that will play Marconi on Friday night. And the Hunter had five named in the Australian school soccer teams after the Nationals at Darwin. John Majorowski and Chris Fleming made the top boys side, while Shane Groen made the A's team. Megan Shepherd and Tracy Oldham made the girls. Thousands gathered last night in Cessnock's Turner Park under a clear evening sky. For most, it started as just a glimpse in the distance, but the torch soon became larger than life as local sportswoman Jennifer Peel made her way to the stage before lighting Cessnock's Olympic cauldron. More than 10,000 people cheered the Olympic spirit. And it was all too much for some. It was so exciting, I felt like I was going to faint. While the crowd partied on, the flame was rested overnight before heading to Weston this morning, where every vantage point was taken. Paul Mead and friends celebrated early on the veranda. Then it was up the hill to Curry, where high school teacher Mike Jobbins and school captain Katie Martin arrived with the torch. It was smiles all round as the entourage headed for Maitland. The uncertainty surrounding the Newcastle Breakers sadly looks set to last a little longer. Soccer Australia yesterday promised a final decision on the club's playing future sometime today, and despite a marathon afternoon meeting on the subject, none's been forthcoming. Lee Sterry, meanwhile, isn't so indecisive, today revealing the Breakers' side that'll take on Marconi in the first round of the inaugural Challenge Cup tomorrow night. New signings, Peter Sakenis, Anthony Surgeon and Nasala Masi have been named in the starting 11 with Catlin, Wicherak, Ferguson, Junknowitz, Trepchewski and McBreen sitting on an extended six-man bench. A $20,000 prize pool is up for grabs in the week-long tournament. Kickoff is at 8pm at Breakers Stadium for the home side with Sydney Olympic playing the Northern Spirit at 6. Colin Baldwin, NBN News. Soccer Australia released its 16 team draw for the coming season today to clubs, which included the Newcastle Breakers, subject to the club's owners proving they're financially viable. It was enough to spark speculation that Newcastle had been given Soccer Australia's blessing to play this season. However, that decision, which has already been delayed several times, was again put back to Monday as lawyers continue to sift through documentation. That's not the only issue that remains unclear, as up to 12 players are effectively off contract, still owed superannuation. Their superannuation will be paid. Any any accrued interest that, that they, um, because of it's not being in that account, will be also met. But many players can walk away now if they choose. If they, if they love this club, and they love the Breakers, and they love Newcastle, then they'll come out here and play. Play is what they'll be doing later tonight against Marconi in the pre-season championship. But the torch relay continuing on in, in the Hunter, it was also getting on uh, right into their own city. Glenn McLeod, NBN News. These kart drivers know exactly know what kart racing is, and because of that, it is the one where you, get, where you have to drive. But with only a car and four wheels, and also. Thankfully, no crushing. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Bike racing is really dangerous, but however, um, uh, some of it might call it dirt track racing. It's, uh, it's also become popular around the Hunter areas as well, with, with plenty of people taking part in it today. As there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of um, jumps 
as well as a lot of tricks up their sleeves as well. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. For a game with a grand final berth at stake, it was a nervous start from both sides. Mistakes and missed chances, the only early highlights. With little ball early, Waratah needed no second chances when it got within range. Darren forward on the end of a great Stu Collins pass. Seeing how it was done, Shane Johnson offered Brett Cullen a run to the line, and the winger helped level things up. However, he could do little but watch at the other end as a chip kick caught him out, Damien Griffiths grabbing a gift four-pointer. A quick tap did likewise for West, Scott Conley racing over, and things were level once again. In the shadows of half-time, Steve Doherty saved a certain Waratah try. Three tackles later, and Cullen's 80-metre effort made sure West went to the break up 16-10. Two quick tries after half-time got things back in the cheaters' favour. Player of the Year Steve Storry's solo effort tipping things Waratah's way. A further blow for West and second rower Scott Connolly in a tackle that raised a few questions. The seesawing battle continued as the clock ticked down. The Cheetahs clawed its way back into a two-point lead. Again, Stu Collins was heavily involved as Waratah snuck home by two and booking a berth with Lakes in the grand final next weekend. Battle scarred and bruised, but no complaints from Waratah Mayfield today. The side through to its first grand final in 10 years. It's been our aim from the start of the year, so uh, now that we're there, uh, we're really looking forward to it. The thrilling 24-22 win against West pits Waratah in a grand final showdown with Lakes United, the same side that humbled the minor premiers in the major semi-final two weeks ago. I know that they'll want it just as bad as us. So, you know, on the game day, it's going to be a very tight match and two sides that are really going to be putting everything into it. Two things are for sure. The Waratahs will be battle-hardened after a bruising match with the Rosellas, while prop Robbie Baker's chip kick for Damien Griffiths is considered well and truly a one-off. Man, we worked on that all week. <laughs> no, I don't think that was Robbie's first kick and it'll probably be his last one. <laughs> Baker's fellow front rower Stu Collins, who's missed much of the year with injury, also stood out in the nail-biter. He set up two tries, including the match winner, to help get the side home by two and set up what will be a memorable week. It's an exciting week for, for all the players and the supporters and I still expect the big crowd there, so uh, it'll be a good day. Mourners filled the church grounds, the final send-off for a man loved and respected by everyone for his goodwill. A professional cyclist for 60 years, those sharing his love of the sport gave him a special escort. Last week, a dream come true turned to tragedy when Ron King died shortly after carrying the torch through his hometown of Musselbrook. A beautiful moment as his son Michael passed on the Olympic flame to his father became their last together. He rode through the Hunter Valley every morning, involved in sport, to the day he died. Friends like Kevin Thompson, who raced alongside and against him over more than half a century, remembered how good it was to know him. He was hard and he was tough. And he was the greatest bloke you could imagine. And as a mark of respect that touched everyone who bought a bike from Mr King over the 47 years he ran his shop, a special guard of honour from Musselbrook High. Many, many children just come to the shop here or have been coming to the shop over the time. Ron will fix their bike and he'll say, never mind, that's right, I'll fix it up with your dad when I see him next. Steve Burriston might be new to coaching the junior kangaroos, but he's no stranger to big-time games. The man behind two Knights jersey flag grand finals and this year's successful New South Wales under-19 side is now looking to send the junior Kiwis packing at North Power Stadium next month. I've had a look at their side and they do have some talented players there. It won't be any easy job for us, but uh, having said that, the side that we've put together looks very strong on paper as well. And there'll be plenty of familiar faces for Burriston in that side. Fledgling Knights first grader Josh Perry for a start. Yeah, that was probably one of my main goals this year. I'm pretty proud that I finally made it. Hopefully there's a few more to come. Joining him will be clubmates Daniel Abraham, Russell Richards and Clint Newton. Representing Australia on the world stage must be in his blood 
He's the son of golfing great Jack Newton. Dad, uh, Dad did extremely well playing golf and hopefully I can follow in his footsteps in another sport, uh, which is rugby league, so um, maybe there's something there, I don't know. Olympic excitement in a country town and a special moment for the King family as a proud son passed the historic flame to his legendary father. A professional racer for 60 years and a national veterans champion, Ron King had dreamed of carrying the torch and everyone in town thought him a genuine man who deserved the honour. According to people in the crowd, for the past 47 years, every kid in Musselbrook has bought a bike from the cycling legend. Michael King thought it was a great experience for him, his father and the whole town. Uh, very, very proud actually. Um, probably the highlight of the whole day for me. Uh, the run up the street and see him standing there waiting in the middle of the main road. Unbelievable. Did cheers? Uh, probably inside, didn't show any outside. Had a, had a put on a good show for the people, but inside, yeah, choked up a little bit, yes. Sadly, the ambulance siren was for his father. 74-year-old Ron King had a heart attack shortly after finishing his leg of the relay. Torch Relay medical staff and ambulance officers worked to revive him. He was taken to Musselbrook Hospital, but could not be saved. Later, at Corindai, participants and Torch Relay spectators had a minute's silence, a mark of respect for Mr King. David McElwain, NBN News. In a sea of flags, a crowd of thousands watched local McDonald's junior manager Brent Dowell ignite the cauldron in Musselbrook. He received the honour after Relay organisers heard how he donated his bone marrow as a 16-year-old, saving his brother's life. The Relay returned to the road this morning, hundreds lining the New England Highway to see it go past the general store at Aberdeen. In Scone, the numbers were swelled by close to a thousand thoroughbreds, setting new records in the horse capital of Australia. Marvellous that they've travelled so far. They've travelled from Sydney, Wyvon, all over, right around to be with us today. And a thousand horses is something really good. Brilliant! What's the last time chance? I think it's a fabulous experience. Jim Clark had the honour of running through the tunnel and he made a quick detour of appreciation. Here he comes, ladies and gentlemen, and give him a big cheer. Determined not to be outdone, Scone School children had a horse parade of their own. Another emotional changeover and Kimberly Deary continued through the town in front of thousands more well-wishers who came to see the flame. Next stop, Murrurundi, and a once-in-a-lifetime event said goodbye to the hunter. Uh, the Olympic flame, of course, uh, was up in Tamworth in the New England Northwest and got there just after 7 o'clock. And because of that, it was just one of the best as it continues up towards northern New South Wales. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Some big celebrations for the Broncos. They got the winner's trophy back to home territory. They proved that they are the best. It's one thing to say you're a championship side, but it certainly is another to actually go through with it. The Broncos lived up to all expectations. And when you go through and analyse the game, the Roosters really did fall quite a bit short of making their mark and their presence felt. The Roosters struggled to make line breaks against the, the Broncos' defence. They struggled with their kicking game, and the edge defence was also pretty ordinary. The Roosters showed some character late in the second half of the try, but I thought Wendell Saylor, Lottie Dakira, and Lockyer were the three big performers on the day. Saylor and Lockyer also submitted spots in the World Cup squad. But I thought the performance of Danny Badiris in the Newcastle Knights' last game against the Roosters would have earned him selection in the squad. He's been one of the best players all season. And it's a championship quality, certainly, to pull out the big performances in the big games. The Australian side is only taking one hooker in Craig Gower. The advantage of including Danny is that he not only can play hooker, he also can handle lock and 5'8". 
It looks like there's up to five clubs who will be receiving penalties for breaching the salary cap this season. Newcastle Knights are definitely one of those. Penalties include a payment of up to 50% of the salary cap breach, and this announcement is to be made October 31st. And the players will be looking forward to probably the longest off-season in recent history, they have a six months off. Season kickoff is back to March next year. Give the players a real chance to recover. Well, that's uh, been the last wrap up for league this year. I hope you did enjoy it. I'll see you soon. Back to you. Taking on a side for which that has never done before, Newcastle knew exactly what to do. And of course, it was their under 19s turn. And of course, Newcastle scored plenty of tries and eventually won. <laughs> the Knights usually enjoy the off-season, but watching the on-field stuff is always, is always part of the plan. That's what really, really swayed me. Just the opportunity that I could be moving in a bit and and getting a permanent permanent spot there. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. A rugby union grand final in the Newcastle competition, of course, came up for uh, came up on the line. And of course, Ace, of course, uh, secured one of their best performances. Not only did they score tries, but they kicked goals as well. Conklin McLeod, NBN News. Andy Roberts holds the breakers close to his heart. He was there when the club began, and now it seems as it finishes. Part of Newcastle's sporting history has died yesterday. But the 191-game NSL veteran is hopeful NSL soccer in Newcastle doesn't die. He'll join fellow players in a meeting with the Northern New South Wales Soccer Federation on Monday night to work out if a team can be put together to play this season. Three weeks, is it enough time? We're in the lap of the gods, mate. Uh, as a player, you, you're just there to, to play and hopefully the administration can take care of itself. It's understood the Federation's proposal would mean shifting the team from Birmingham Gardens to Marathon Stadium, with the local Federation acting as caretaker until financial backing was secured. While the team still has a chance of playing, however, creditors still owed money from Breakers owner David Hall aren't nearly as optimistic. Oh, not a great deal. Not a great deal. Jim, uh, that's not one of his strong points, I believe. Mr Collins headed the consortium that originally sold the club to Mr Hall and it still owed around $1.25 million. Breakers management didn't wish to speak on camera today other than to say they're bitterly disappointed and upset at Soccer Australia's decision and have sought legal advice. Jim Callanan, NBN News. And of course, after the break, we'll have the, uh, we'll have the last one, the highlights from the uh, Olympic month which of course, September 2000, after the break. Big business now, are we? Nope. I'm quite happy with the small business I own, Louise. Who are you banking with now, Bob? Newcastle Permanent. No, I know. I mean, your, your company banking. Yeah, yeah, we're with the firm. Didn't know they did business banking? Well, I have done for quite some time now, Dad. Oh, good move. That's mine. Thank you. <laughs> your business is in good hands with Newcastle Permanent. The Our Booming Society.